Hello, welcome to my channel. As you have uh, asked, I am going to make a video on Joyant Mahapatra's Dawn at Puri this time. I am going to explain the poem as I have understood it and hope this helps. If this helps, like, share and subscribe. Also, if you need tuitions, the link is there, the website is there, given. So, you may check it out. Anyway, let's begin with Down at Puri by Jayanto Mahapatra. Jayanto Mahapatra was born in 1928 in Orissa, India. He belonged to a lower middle class family and he became a professor of physics. That was his professional career and as a poet he is considered to be a pioneering figure among the Indian poets of modern Indian English writing. His name stands beside A.K. Ramanujan and Kamaladas and so on. So he received the prestigious Shaita Academy Award. He was the first ever Indian to receive the award as a poet who writes in the English language. He also received the uh, Padma Shri Award in 2009 but renounced it in 2015 uh, as a protest against rising intolerance in India. As we read his poems we find that there is uh, a sense of despair in his poetry. He portrays the traditional customs, the uh, cultural customs, rites and rituals, religious customs that are practiced in India and he presents all these things to show us that how we are eager to follow the so-called faith and in our process of blindly following faith, we neglect the real life issues that are always in front of us, like poverty, etc. So his poem, his poems are not always arguing, not always arguing directly against such things, such practices, but they present an expression of despair. That is because as an Indian, we understand that you cannot change this, uh, this habit of following uh, these practices because the majority of the people, the mass, follows these things and you cannot argue, you are outnumbered. You cannot show them that they are doing something which is meaningless and hollow at the core. Whereas they are neglecting some real issues, they are not caring enough about their real lives but they are more caring enough about their afterlife so you cannot argue with the majority if the majority is following some uh, practice that is meaningless and you know that it will go on the process is endless but you understand the meaninglessness of these practices, then all you can 
feel is despair but you can do nothing about it you cannot argue because that is futile you cannot explain them you cannot make them understand they are going to follow these practices in the name of tradition in the name of heritage in the name of culture in the name of religion in the name of faith whatever in the name of spiritualism you cannot change these things but you can feel that this is not not something meaningful while there are so many real life problems around so the poet expresses despair that kind of despair in his poems and this poem is not an exception so this poem dawn at puri is is uh, taken from a collection of poems which is titled a reign of rights rights means uh, the 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 practices that you follow the customs that you follow religiously the rituals that you follow because of your faith and uh, which which do not have any uh which do not provide any solution to the social problems or issues of real life so this country our country india has this reign of rights it is always reigning with rights there are so many rituals there are so many traditional customs that we indulge in and we do not observe the life that is around us so this poem dawn at puri as the title says it is set in the city of puri which is situated in orissa this city puri is considered by the believers to be a holy city they believe it to be a holy city because there is a temple of jagannath jagannath temple and there is a place uh, a cremation ground a crematorium uh, called uh, the shwargadar crematorium and etc uh, this place uh, is considered to be holy because the believers believe that if after your death your body is cremated in that place you have a confirmed ticket to heaven the swargadar the word swargadar literally means gateway to heaven so it is considered to be such a holy place now this poem is about a dawn at that holy place this poem presents the temple and the life around it and the cremation ground and the and the faith that people follow here puri the city of puri is not only the city of puri it represents the whole country in a way because the faith that you follow and the rituals that you practice are same or similar in all the places throughout the country you just need a temple you just need a priest you just need an occasion that's it so here puri is not only puri it is whole india and the indian mentality of following the traditional 
religious cultural customs so the poem begins with these lines endless crow noises a skull in the holy sands tilts its empty country towards hunger if you take the first line endless crow noises you see that when dawn comes when daybreak comes it is natural that the crows will caw but here the words endless and noises make us understand that these cawings of the crows is not very pleasant is not very pleasant because it is endless and it is not uh, it is not pleasant and it is uh, mentioned as noises now why the crows are making such endless noise a skull in the holy sands so there is a skull in the holy sands now according to hindu tradition according to hindu religious custom after death the body is burnt is cremated and in that process nothing remains except ashes so if there is a skull in the holy sands that means the ritual of cremation for someone someone's dead body was incomplete that's why the skull is there remaining it should have been burnt but it is not burnt it is there it is scattered on the sand and uh, it is a piece of body that is not uh, taken care of that is neglected now this negligence shows this is this is symbolic basically this shows that the ritual of uh, of this hindu custom all these hindu customs or all these uh, all these religious customs are not not uh, not very significant they are hollow at the core they are with all their imperfections and hypocrisies they seem to be very significant but they are not that's why the skull is there nobody cares about it but the crows why why does the crow care about the skull because it is dawn and the crow is trying to look for food naturally the crow is looking at the skull the crows rather are looking at the skull because they are hungry and this is as the poet writes the holy sands here the holy the word holy is used with a with an ironic tone okay so tilts its empty country towards hunger the country is empty empty why why is the country empty because it is filled with so many hollow concept of holiness so many hollow religious rituals that it is empty at the core it does not look at itself and its real problems problems like hunger so the country is day by day it struggles with hunger hunger is a result of poverty so here hunger clearly points at poverty poverty is a serious problem in this country the country is going towards towards the 
towards the menace of poverty day by day but it's empty it's empty in its head because it is focused on the holiness of of such lands such faith such rituals such practices so the crows are calling the crows are making noises looking at the skull the crows are making a point that we are hungry we look at the skull as food you look at it you look at the cremation ground as a holy ground you neglected the skull that's why we are looking at it and making noises because we are hungry and your people the people of the country they are also suffering from poverty hunger is a serious problem here but you are indulging in such ideas of holiness and such ideas of holy rites rituals so that is the explanation that i can give you for this for these three lines so when poverty pursues its people the country's people from the dawn to the dusk it is hollow it is meaningless to follow faith so much and forget the problems that are real that are there in your real life the life the life around you you are thinking about after life you are thinking about heaven and hell but you are in the process you are forgetting about the life that you actually have now you don't know about after life nobody does so the country which is loaded with emptiness at its daily practices moves towards hunger without any restraint and the people are being blind to it because they are more interested in after life than the life that they actually have now look at the title of the poem again dawn at puri you see whenever you have read a literary piece most of the time you have seen that dawn the word dawn presents an optimistic note it symbolizes a new day a new hope a new life optimism all over it is a it is a positive symbol all the time here the poet has given the title as dawn at puri but this dawn is different this dawn is not symbolizing optimism this dawn is showing a dawn of despair a dawn that comes every day the light falls on the crowd around you the people around you the lives around you and if you observe closely you see that all these lives all these people they are struggling with real issues issues that we will we will be talking about while discussing the other lines of the poem he has shown us some issues he has observed and presented before us that if 
we look at the dawn at Puri. It is our problem that we only see holiness all around. There are, among that so-called holiness, there are problems in front of us. We just cannot see it because faith has made us blind or we deliberately neglect it. That is our hypocrisy. Now, what is it? Hypocrisy or blindness? That is another question. He is not asking that question in the poem, but he is presenting the simple thing that is visible here, that we are not looking, we are not looking closely at the picture. Whenever we think about the dawn at Puri, we think about the sunrise, the romantic image of sunrise, the seashore. We can be romantic about it, but we don't know about the lives of the fishermen. We, don't, we, we see the fishermen in front of us, we just don't observe them. We look at them, but we are blind to them their lives, their lifestyles. Similarly, we look at the temple, but we don't look at the needy people in front of it. We don't look at the widows in front of it. We look at the cremation ground and we, we think that this is a holy place to die at or be cremated at, but we forget about the, the real problems all around the place. He is showing these things throughout these poems. Let us continue. The next three lines are White-clad widowed women past the centers of their lives are waiting to enter the great temple. Now again, you can see the great temple, the word great is also ironic here. But we'll come to that point. Let us begin with white clad widowed women. White clad, why? Because in, in uh, Hindu uh, tradition, the widows, once, once you are, you know, once women are widowed, they have to live a life. They have to live a life with even more restrictions than they had till then. Women are restricted all throughout their lives, but the restrictions get to the highest point once they are widowed because they do not have their husbands to stand beside them. The society takes the advantage and in the name of social customs, they put restrictions. The women who are widowed are clad in white because white is the color that they have to wear traditionally as a widow, according to Hindu customs. Even if a widow is not so much traditional all the time, she can never wear or use the color red in any way. That is completely out of the question as a Hindu widow. That is one restriction. Even if he is, uh, she is, uh, she is, not old enough. She has to leave all her desires, all her wishes, all that uh, she wants from her life. So, as soon as as soon as uh, someone is widowed, she has passed the center of her life. What does this mean? The center of her life. You see, in a patriarchal society, 
being a conservative Hindu. Women are taught in a patriarchal society which is conservative and Hindu. Women are taught and they become accustomed to it that, that uh, they are secondary to men. Man is like the sun, the star, around which their very existence has to revolve around like the planets. The course of the life of a woman must run depending depending on the idea of man being the authority. Now, it is taught from the beginning of their lives that it is their job to accompany, entertain and satisfy men. So, their very existence is dependent on the existence of man. Naturally, see, when a, when a girl, a little girl, is being told a story or a fairy tale or a song, little lullaby or a rhyme, She is always given the idea of being a fair wife, a good wife, uh, maintaining a family very well. You see, the games which we call feminine have at their core the idea of uh, creating a family and being in the family as a servant of the family, being faithful as a wife and, uh, you know, worshipping the hero of their life as their husband and etc. Everything, everything a girl is taught, all the time they are taught that how to be likable, how to be likable as a girl from the male perspective. They are told you, you cannot laugh hard, it doesn't look very, you know, likable to men. You have to wear these, you have to talk in, a, in such a manner, you have to look beautiful, that is the most vague concept, you have to look beautiful. And after some years, they believe and follow these things that they are taught, naturally, as, as, as faith also works. You are not born with a faith, you are given, you are injected with these ideas. And after being injected for some years, you believe in it. You believe in ghosts, you believe in fairies. If you are told of these things in your childhood for a long time, you believe in these things. Similarly, if you are taught that you have to please men, you have to be beautiful, uh, that, uh, that every man should look at you and um, believe that you are very likable, then being taught these things through many years, you, you, are, you, you become obsessed with these ideas. You, you think that these are the ideas that uh, I have to uh, believe and I, th these are the core, core objectives of my life. As a woman you believe that. So, I just, I just have a, a, a Bengali uh, lullaby. I, I just cannot, you know, uh, neglect this, this has come to my mind. There is a Bengali lullaby when a little girl uh, is lulled to sleep 
they used to sing these things that dol dol duluni ranga mathay chiruni bor ashbe ekhuni niye jabe tokhuni see all the four lines there are the first one dol dol duluni is 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 you know just uh doing this this thing okay and when when it is a baby and the second line says that ranga mathai chiruni first of all it is an idea it is a it is a concept about how to look beautiful and the chiruni the 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 the, the kum is very important the hair is important see and then borash be ekhuni the husband will come see it is a lullaby to a baby girl it is very popular it is very traditional and what is this tradition teaching us from the beginning point of our lives that a woman's life is concentrated on the idea of getting a husband now what happens what happens if if you are fed with these ideas from the beginning point of your life first half of your life i mean up until marriage everything you everything that you think about is dependent on an x factor that if my husband uh becomes like this then i will be able to do that if my husband uh, lives abroad then i have to go abroad if my husband is uh, uh, conservative then i have to be follow uh, I, i have to follow the his ideas etc and if uh, you have to you are fed with these ideas so all the time you are thinking that what what do i want what do i want to be what do i want to do what do i like there is no i this i is completely dependent on the x factor called a future husband that will my husband future husband like this habit will my future husband be interested in me if i wear these clothes will my future husband be interested in me if i uh, choose this uh, particular career path all these ideas are there inside a girl's head because it is fed that is the first half of their lives the second half begins with the marriage then the actual real figure of the husband has come and you are already taught that you are secondary to men and you have practiced that without without the husband being present you have already practiced that because you inside your mind you you have been dependent on the x factor of the husband whom you have never seen who is to come in the future then he comes and when he comes naturally you accept your married life you just you just uh, follow the traditional uh, teachings and you just serve your husband in every way possible you try to be faithful to him please him in every way entertain him accompany him everything you are secondary to him your life is secondary to his life and that's what you are taught and now if you are widowed think about it your whole life has revolved around the idea of this x factor unseen or seen unseen future husband potential husband and seen actual husband of the married life your whole life has revolved around this star this sun this man this idea of man this idea of husband 
who is your only support who is your only you know everything okay now he has gone naturally society takes the opportunity and puts restriction on you the center of your life has gone and your life is falling apart without the center i am just taking the line from it i don't know somehow i i have just taken the line the center has gone and your life is falling apart so you are given restrictions what kind of restrictions you are given a uh, restriction such as uh, you have to uh, wear uh, white then uh, you have to uh, mm, you have to leave all kinds of uh, desire you, you 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 cannot have any kind of desire uh, of the mind or the body uh, you have to leave all kinds of uh, pleasures and pleasurable activities you have to maintain fast on every trivial occasion on every trivial occasion often more than once in a fortnight uh you cannot eat as you like your food choices are restricted you cannot use uh, your food choices are restricted that means you cannot eat uh, fish you cannot if uh, eat onion you cannot eat uh, there are many things that you cannot eat okay so uh you cannot uh, use the color red in any way you have to wear uh, white colored clothes and uh, you cannot be present at any happy occasion such as a marriage ceremony because that is uh, a holy thing a very positive thing and you are a widow so you are not so positive so it is not good for you because you have lost your husband you are not good to be there that is what tradition teaches us right and we follow these traditions you see my mother is a widow i cannot argue with her i just cannot she understands everything but follows the tradition and this point will come this point will come at the end of this poem too you see he continues that the 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 widows have passed the centers of their lives and they are waiting to enter the great temple because all they are left with is the idea of being reunited reunited uh with their you know husband who was given to them by destiny and uh, it is a bond of you know life after life etc so they believe that i have to leave all the pleasures the center of my life has gone and i have to wait for death maintaining all the holy rites in the process so that i can be reunited with my husband after death and that is my job to serve him even in after life even in the life next if it is so that is the concept see they are left with nothing in life and naturally all they have is to wait wait to enter the great temple they are actually waiting to die society has given them the pathway that you you can go nowhere you can do nothing except waiting suffering uh, with all these restrictions in the name of holiness in the name of uh, sacred rites you have to wait and die they believe it and what can they do so they try to go to the great temple in the morning to see the lord there 
so they can you know they can have a you know a kind of uh, punno or something added to their lives and that is the only thing they are left with so naturally they wait there their austere eyes the next lines next three lines their austere eyes stare like those caught in a net hanging by the dawn's shining strands of faith their eyes are austere the widow's eyes are austere austere means devoid of any pleasure desire etc like uh, it's like uh, nirvan or something like that that you have no desire left you have nothing uh, to take pleasure from in this life you have left all the pleasures of the life and you are austere so they are austere eyes this word this adjective austere here is also ironic because you can see stare like those caught in a net hanging by the dawn's shining strands of faith hanging sorry caught in a net uh we are talking about fish you see jayant mahapatra is writing about puri and there are fishermen around fishing is a job there uh, which is very common and fish are caught in a net and they are they are uh, taken to the shore and when a when a fish is in a net caught in a net it is either dead or almost dead now fishes have lidless eyes so their eyes have a vacant kind of stare you can look at the eyes and you you cannot understand from the eyes whether they are living or they are dead it is the rest of the body that tells you right if they are you know they are they are they are uh, moving to some extent then you can say that it is not yet dead if they are still then you can see you can say that they are dead but looking at the eyes you cannot tell because lidless eyes uh, they do not have to you know blink they do not have the necessity to blink so fishes are different from us and their uh, their eyes are uh, different uh, naturally their uh, lidless eyes they, they they do not provide any expression that is vacant stare which is lifeless naturally their austere eyes the widow's austere eyes are being compared to those eyes of the fish that are caught in a net so the poet is saying that these widows are living according to biology they are living because they are moving they are waiting in front of the uh, great temple but their eyes are so austere according to one perspective that the poet compares them these eyes to the lifeless eyes of a fish that means they are living with lifelessness they are living in this world but they do not have a life hanging by the dawns it is you know hanging by the dawns shining strands of faith here shining strands of faith the fishes are caught in a net and they are taken to the seashore the net is on the strand and you can see their lidless eyes etc at the same time these widows the, the the net is a metaphor 
these widows are caught in the net of faith which is we look at it as if it is a shining strand because we glorify faith we glorify these practices we we say that this is a very good thing to practice such things you know this is we we glorify it that's why to our eyes these practices are like the shining strand but actually these widows are like the fish caught in a net on the shining strand they are caught in the net of this so called holy faith and holy practices which we look at and say that it is like shining strand but it is not it is actually a net from which a fish cannot get out to life and from which the widows cannot get out to life they are living but their living is lifeless so let's move on to the next three lines the frail early light now we go on to a different image okay a different uh, view up until this point we were looking at the widowed women now we are looking at the needy people the frail early light catches ruined leprous shells leaning against one another a mass of crouched faces without names the frail early light catches the frail early light because the light is weak and very very temporary because it is dawn it is dawn you see dawn is the time of daybreak just when the night goes out and morning is about to come in that is the time of dawn and the light is very weak the light is just coming and that frail light that weak light that very temporary light catches another picture gives us another picture the picture of ruined leprous shells this is also another metaphor ruined leprous shells that means there are you see sea shells which are beautiful which are which gets all the attention which are uh, bought or taken by tourists so they are they they have some value naturally they get all the attention they get all the care but not all the seashells are beautiful smooth uh, white and everything some are ruined some are leprous not so beautiful these shells are not cared about these are also seashells these are also the same thing but they are not beautiful they are leprous they are ruined so we don't care about these things they are scattered here and there nobody cares about them just like that we are people human beings all human beings should have we say we have but should have the same the equal rights on earth because we have come with this you know as a result of the same process none of us did apply to come here all of us has just come and all of us has a right to expect the same amount or similar uh, amount of uh, positive experiences from life but some people are not so fortunate they are leprous nobody cares about them they are ruined their lives are ruined they are needy people they do not have 
money nobody is attentive towards their struggles and these people gather around such great holy temples and they wait leaning against one another they wait there are so many people like these needy people they, they are so many in numbers they are leaning against one another and they are trying to make a living they are they are trying to beg the day has come it is their time to start begging in front of the temple from the visitors they try to get something to make a living to live on that is a desperate thing to do nobody cares about them and that's why a mass of crouched faces they are crouched they are crouched physically literally of course also they are crouched because they are in their life they cannot metaphorically stand straight their life has not given, given them the opportunity to look forward with a straight face they are bearing a burden of life and yet they are they are they are bearing it because it is also it is also a sin to commit suicide of course naturally even if you are you have nothing in your life you are ruined faith will tell you that you have to live on not only not only faith will tell you that everyone will tell you that but of course and you believe perhaps perhaps you have lost all the beliefs that 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 the next day will be better you know the next day will be will not be better but you still go on you don't know why you just go on now these people their lives are ruined they are perhaps leprous nobody uh, cares about them perhaps they are beggars needy people suffering from poverty suffering from carelessness suffering from negligence they are there crouched faces and they do not have names they do not have names they are nameless that means nobody cares about their names they do not have an identity they they do not have any identity you see from the perspective of democracy if we talk about democracy we can we, we can see that that the 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 laborers who migrate to different states are not cared as voters because they do not come to vote they do not come come back to home to vote they do not the, we we do not care about the beggars we do not care about the uh, we do not care about many people just because they are not giving us anything they are not giving us vote the politicians think like that we common people we think that we have nothing to gain from them so the mentality is like that that we are not going to care about these people because we have nothing to gain from these people that is the idea and we do not care about the people who stand in a position in a social position that is below us we always care about the people who are at least equal to us or belongs to a higher class that is our mentality that is our very humane idea and we are very faithful people we follow faith we seek uh, uh, we, we 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 do not want to commit sin we seek the opposite and uh, we try to be pious holy all the time but we do not care about humanity as a whole that is why these people they do not have any identity they are leprous people they are beggars they are needy people we don't look at them 
we don't want to know their stories we don't want to think about their struggles that is very depressing faith is very interesting it won't depress you but these real problems i don't want to hear about it that is very depressing because if i hear about this there will be some kind of moral compunction inside my brain talking to me that what can i do what should i have done or that this is a real problem i have to think about it i have to care about it that is a responsibility a true responsibility inside your head but that is a responsibility that is a burden faith is easy you just follow like a sheep you just follow the group everyone is doing i am doing everyone is good i am good fine so these people they have no names let us move on to the last two stanzas of the poem because they are uh, presenting before us a uh, one one single image here uh, it focuses on uh, the, these two stan stanzas uh, they focus on uh, the cremation ground so let us uh, read the lines together and suddenly breaks out of my height into the smoky blaze of a sullen solitary pyre that fills my aging mother her last wish to be cremated here twisting uncertainly like light on the shifting sands so naturally the poet is talking about the cremation ground there is a solitary pyre and the natural uh, and the poet is talking about his aging mother until this point he was observing what was going on in front of the temple and now he is talking about that all on a sudden his 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 uh, his focus has uh, diverted and uh, all on a sudden there is a smoke rising upwards uh, from a uh, sullen solitary pyre from the uh, uh, from the holy cremation ground the smoke rises uh, the smoke rises and upwards and that fills my aging mother fills that means fills emotionally she feels thrilled with religious spiritual uh, sensations sentiments and she looks at the smoke going upwards and she thinks of the holiness in that ritual she thinks about the holiness of the ground and it is her last wish she had she she has made her last wish to the poet to her son that when i die i i must be cremated here why because i have already told you the place is called swarga dwar literally means gateway to heaven it is believed by the believers i am all the time saying believers because believers believe rational people they argue they want to know things believers just believe they can believe in anything they can believe the earth is flat they can believe the theory of creation they can believe uh, that uh, the solar system is geocentric they can believe in anything there is no gst on belief okay there is no tax on belief you can believe in anything now the believers believe that this is a holy place and if your body is cremated 
at this place, your ticket to heaven is confirmed. That means you are going to heaven in afterlife. It is uh, certain. And this certainty is ridiculed here. You see, at the last line, the poet says, twisting uncertainly like light on the shifting sands. She is making her wish that yes, this smoke, this smoke has given me a particular sensation that this place is very holy and that when I die, I wish to be cremated here because this is a holy land. She is thrilled and she is, her body is twisting with, you know, with uh, overflowing excitement of uh, religious sensations. Her body is twisting and the poet is comparing the, the, that kind of that kind of thrill, that kind of twisting effect with the light on the shifting sands. You see, when a smoke goes upwards, you know that it will go upwards. But do you know what kind of twists and turns it will take in its course? No. Sometimes it will go right, sometimes it will go left, sometimes it will go just upwards, sometimes it will go slow, sometimes it will not go so, so much slow. So you can predict the exact course of the smoke. Why? You know physics, you know the basic laws of physics, but, but you cannot predict. Why? Because there are too many variables. The wind, the speed of the wind, the temperature, the, the humidity, everything matters. And all these things are, they are constantly changing in their own way. So too many variables, you cannot, that's why you cannot predict the exact course of the, the you cannot be certain about the course that the smoke is going to take. Similarly, think about the seashore. There is sand there and there is, you know, very strong wind there. Naturally, the wind blows on the, on the sand and the sand a little, you know, little by little it moves this way, that way. It, it changes its, uh, you know, apparent shape. Naturally, the sunlight at the dawn is falling on the sand from a certain angle but the, because of the sand is constantly moving its position the reflection the colors that you get the effect that you get looking at the sand changes every moment you cannot predict that either because you don't know how the sand will change posi positions at the very next moment you don't know you cannot predict it you are not certain about the, 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 the reflection of the sunlight. You are not certain about the, the smoke that is going towards so-called heaven, upwards. But you are sure. Once you are blind towards faith, you are sure that if I am cremated here, I am going to heaven. When real life is so uncertain at every step, you are certain about afterlife that if I do this and this and this, I will have this in afterlife. That certainty is ridiculous. The poet is not arguing with his mother. The poet is not arguing with anybody because you cannot argue with, with faith. Faith is not, you know, it is beyond all arguments. You cannot argue with it. You know that it will go on. It is our tradition. It is our culture. It is our habit. It is what we are so fond of. We are so prancingly proud of. The poet knows that. He feels despair because he, is a, he as, I, as I have told you, he was a professor of physics. 
he has a scientific mind he knows that everything each and every thing that he has pointed out all the rituals all the practices they are meaningless they are hollow at the core he knows but it is his despair that he knowing all this has to look at this and he can do nothing so he has to feel sad looking at this meaninglessness endless meaninglessness and that's why this poem is a poem of despair this is not a poem of argument this is not this poem is not saying how stupid all these things are why and how this poem is just presenting before us what is before us in the holy land but we don't look at it we see but he has observed that is the difference we see but he has observed i am again taking a line from sherlock holmes i'm sorry but anyway i'm trying to convey the difference everything every picture that he has portrayed here are in front of us if we are there in front of the temple these pictures get life but will we be able to see these things we shall i have seen my mother looking at the temple and temple only with with such an eye that that i i did not know whether to laugh or to get scared what kind of a vision is that that does not look right left it it does not look anywhere except the top of the temple i did not go to the temple of course but my mother was looking at it and th th that that stare scared me that is faith you see that is faith you cannot change it because it is followed by so many people you can understand the situation you can observe the situation and all you can do is feel despair that the real issues that the real picture is not being seen although it is in front of us whereas we are looking at after life whereas we are looking at holiness which is hollow at the core now as i have already shown you that this poem is filled with images metaphors there is another thing to show at least another thing that i can say at this moment there is another thing to notice that the style of writing specifically i am talking about that uh, i am talking about the rhythmlessness the there is no rhyme there is no rhyme pattern or there is no metrical scheme uh also the punctuations are very weird it is a tendency of modern poems that they do not restrict or restrain themselves according to the structures given by grammar or punctuations they express something and these modern poems they express something and their objective is to make you feel that expression they do not so much care about maintaining the the Uh, rules and everything because the rules some sometimes they they make our expressions confined in some way 
also the poem seems to have a lack of full stops especially at the end even at the end of the poem there is no full stop why because the despair that the poet is feeling cannot be concluded with a full stop it it is never ending it is endless it goes on and on that's why shifting sands no full stop the poem ends abruptly without a full stop because the poet has expressed his despair but the ex the, the the despair doesn't end there that's why the poet the poet is not concluding the poem with a stop he is leaving it just there because it continues the reign of right will continue as it has been always you can feel despair you can feel a kind of a uh, desolate uh, sadness looking at reality and feeling that you are able to observe these things while the people who are suffering actually they even they cannot observe life in that way so you feel sad you feel also lonely with your understanding but you know that you cannot do anything this despair this loneliness this understanding of your and uh, your your alone you know your lone understanding will be there it is a continuous flow it has no end that's why the poem does not end with a full stop so i have tried a bit to to give you some idea as i have understood the poem i am no scholar i just i am a student and i read literature i think about it that's it i am no scholar i cannot say that what i have told you are the only explanations okay i don't think anyone can say that or should say that but i am not at, at least saying that whatever i have told you are the only meanings only possible meanings no that's how i have understood the poem i have tried to give you an understanding i have tried to convey what i have understood uh and i think uh it will help you a little if this helps do help me a bit by liking sharing and commenting if you have a uh, questions thank you for today and if you want any other video on any other topic write in the comments thank you